Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and I apologize for not being back to you, but I've been preparing to go on really the only vacation I've ever had that's just pure vacation. So here I am in Houma, Louisiana, visiting my best friend, Mary, who I have not seen in 26 years. So um, I'm going to be doing a reading, and I'm going to be reading every day now that I'm here. So for, for sure for the next seven days, I, I don't have any work or anything to do. So I'm going to for sure make a reading every day. This is Poison Power by Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin, as you know. And we are on Chapter 9, Alternatives Available to Us, on page 219. And we are on the subchapter called Cost Versus Benefits of Increased Electric Power. And so let me pick this back up. We are on the third chapter of page 219. The present-day industrialists and many of their governmental counterparts say we cannot turn back the clock. No one concerned with the environmental crisis is talking about turning back the clock. Quite the contrary, environmentalists are concerned with ending the laissez-faire line of least resistance approach pursued by our government and industry. We must demand that our government and industry leave this path and challenge them to meet the real needs of society without degrading, but by improving the environment. Our scientists and technologists should be urged to use their skills for solving the difficult problems that have been neglected for decades. Turn back the clock? Hardly. That is the problem. We approach we are approaching the 21st century with 19th century concepts. The environmentalists want to set the clock to the correct time, now. This was stated very eloquently by the noted scientist and philosopher Bertrand Russell. I actually didn't know Bertrand Russell was a scientist. Quote, Whether men will be able to survive the changes of environment that their own skill has brought about is an open question. If the day is in the if the answer is in the affirmative, it will be known some day. If not, not. If the answer is to be in the affirm affirmative, men will have to apply scientific ways of thinking to themselves and their institutions. They cannot continue to hope, as all politicians hitherto have, that in a world where everything has changed, the political and social habits of the 18th century can remain inviolate. Not only will men of science have to grapple with the sciences that deal with man, but, and this is a far more difficult matter, they will have to persuade the world to listen to what they have discovered. If they cannot succeed in this difficult enterprise, man will destroy himself by his halfway cleverness. I am told that if he were out of the way, the future would lie with rats. I hope that they I hope they will find it a pleasant world, but I am glad I shall not be there. Unquote. And that was by Bertrand Russell, Science and Human Life, quoted in Scientists as Writers, edited by James Harrison, Cambridge, Mass., MIT Press, 1965, pages 145 and 146. New subchapter, subtitle. In his talk cited earlier, Commissioner Baggy states, Faced with these pessimistic developments in the nuclear field, it has become evident that the need for fossil fuel generation will appreciably increase. Even if nuclear generation should emerge as originally envisioned, fossil fuel generation will nearly double in the next 20 years. Too many, especially those who have counted so heavily on nuclear generation, this realization has been slow and difficult. It even caught some segments of the industry unprepared. After all, who wanted to consider the environmental ugly duckling when the promise of the nuclear generation was ultimately to redeem this industry? The problem posed by the necessity to rely on fossil fuel generation as the backbone of the industry for many years to come is compounded by the fact that low sulfur fossil fuels are simply not presently available in sufficient quantities to clear the air pollution hurdle which now has been imposed upon the industry. Unquote. 
Later in that speech, Commissioner Baggy explains the major reason, the major reason for the air pollution from fossil fuel plants. Quote, the research and development effort for atomic energy received over 84% of all the federal funds for energy research and development. It also received approximately $3 billion of government expenditures over the past 20 years. Now this was written in 1970. $3 billion. Compared with this ambitious federal commitment to atomic energy, the amounts of money which have and are being allocated for improvement of fossil fuel generation and for other fossil fuel energy research are ridiculously small." Unquote. No shit. Uh, the September 14, 1970 issue of Barron's National Business and Financial Weekly carried a front page article titled Coal Ambroglio. Imbroglio. I have no idea what that means. I M B R O G L I O. That echoed Commissioner Baggy's assessment. Quote Legislation aside, Washington for years has subsidized the design, development, and through underpricing enriched uranium operation of nuclear power plants. Official enthusiasm, generated largely by the Atomic Energy Commission, also succeeded in overselling the utilities to their state. Excuse me, I'm going to read that again. I don't know where to start. It's a long sentence. Official enthusiasm, generated largely by the Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, which is now the NRC, also succeeded in overselling the utilities on their state of perfection and readily capability and ready capability, a miscalculation which the latter aren't likely to repeat. On the contrary, Duke Power reportedly has bought its own coal reserves, while Duquesne Light has agreed to finance the expansion of mine capacity. Wow. And Koch brothers, I hate them. Five years ago, if the AEC had had its way, coal might have been scuttled and a temporary crisis mushroomed into a national blackout. Private enterprise is vastly fallible, fallible but it usually pays for and corrects its mistakes. The powers that be tend to perpetuate them or make them worse." Unquote. Thus, we see that fossil fuels will form the backbone of our electrical generating capacity well into the 21st century. Exactly. We can expect twice as many fossil fuel plants over the next two decades. So it is imperative that we develop pollution-free fossil fuel generating plants. In August, on August 28, 1970, an issue of Science, Dr. Arthur M. Squires published a lead article entitled, Clean Power from Coal. Uh, Arthur M. Squire, Clean Power from Coal, Science, page one, uh, Science Edition 169, pages 821 through 828, 1970. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, in this article, he demonstrates that he could have clean fossil fuel, that we could have clean... I'm sorry, I'm going to start that again. I apologize. In this article, he demonstrates that we could have clean fossil fuel plants if we supplied the necessary research and development dollars, dollars that are almost all entirely devoted to atomic power. Moreover, he demonstrates that the net result would be not only clean power, but cheaper power. That's what Germany did. Germany has very clean coal plants, or cleanest, I guess. The power, the power would be cheaper because the efficiency of the plant would be increased. As much as 50% more power could be produced per ton of fuel burned. If this, this would substantially reduce the problems associated with waste heat. Dr. Philip H. Abelson, editor of the American Association for Advancement of Science, concluded an editorial on September 25, 1970, issue of Science, as follows. Quote, In principle, all our energy needs could be met for a long time with coal. 
This raw material could be processed to yield sulfur-free fuel, liquid hydrocarbons, and methane. In practice, however, the development of the use of coal is limping along and is underfinanced. A few hundred million dollars a year devoted to research development and demonstration plants could make the most valuable expenditure the United States government could make. Unquote. If we improved the efficiency of fossil fuel plants and made them pollution free, we could reduce the waste heat problem and literally create a breathing spell wherein we can await the safe development of the power sources for the future. Wow. So you see what I'm saying? Dr. Tam um, Goffman and Tamplin, they were not against nuclear. They just thought that we shouldn't be using it right now until we understand it. Okay, new subtitle, Power Sources for the Future. Now that our declining environmental quality is beginning to receive proper notice, more and more of our best scientific and engineering talent is beginning to look at our means of generating power. We can therefore anticipate that some novel approaches will surface. One such approach is the use of solar energy, which bathes the earth each day. Although this idea has been denigrated for years, we should not cast it aside until these fresh looks at the problem have been given an opportunity. Geothermal energy, underground steam, and tidal energy deserve imaginative consideration as potential additions to our pollution-free sources of power. Professor Robert Rex uh, quoted in Pollution Free Power from Out of the Earth by Marshall Swartz, San Francisco Chronicle, October 29, 1970, of the Institute of Geophysics, University of California, has recently reported that one geothermal field running from the Salton Sea deep into Mexico is massive. The seam available from just the U.S. portion of this reservoir uh, of underground stored energy, he estimates, could provide 20,000 to 30,000 megawatts of power, as much power as the total current generating capacity of the entire state of California, 27,700 megawatts. Professor Rex estimates that such sources of incredible amounts of energy can last undiminished for 100 to 300 years. Numerous other resource experts continue to express enthusiasm for the pollution-free power readily available to man from such geothermal sources. A minor diversion of ill-advised funds in the AEC Fast Breeder Program could materially advance geothermal electric power generation. Well, we know what happened to that idea, right? The 86 did. Many have expressed doubts as to whether fission reactors will ever represent an acceptable answer to our electrical power needs. We have described the problems associated with disposing of their radioactive waste. These alone are strong arguments against these reactors. The principal projected power source of the future is the fusion reactor. Some of the more recent estimates suggest that a successful fusion reactor can be developed within the same time period as required for the fast breeder reactor within the next 15 to 30 years. If we can develop a fusion reactor, fission reactors would become obsolete. A present nuclear, the present nuclear reactors and the fast breeders are looking more and more like potentially dangerous lame duck technology. If these fission reactors are not exploited quickly, they will most likely never be used. And boy, were they exploited. Fusion power makes use of the Excuse me, fusion power makes use of the nuclear reactions that are occurring in the sun. The nuclei of the lighter atoms, such as the hydrogen isotopes, are fused together to form heavier atoms. By this process, large amounts of energy is released. Besides being intrinsically much safer, fusion reactors will produce substantially less radioactivity than fission reactors, which which lasts possibly a million, 
possibly a million times less. I'm going to read that again, I'm sorry. Besides being intrinsically much safer, fusion reactors will produce substantially less radioactivity than fission reactors, possibly a million times less. The potential of these plants is truly unlimited. For example, there are cycles where the contemplated efficiency is 90%. This means that only 10%, not the present 60 to 70% of the heat is wasted as an environmental pollutant. So right now they're wasting 60 to 70%. Wow. Fusion reactor research and development has been severely shortchanged in much the same manner as fossil fuel research and development. We are the nation that developed, through a crash program, the Armada of World War II, the atomic thin hydrogen bombs, and landed man on the moon. Hmm. Could we not, through an orderly program, develop the electrical power generation mechanism for the future? Do we have to perpetuate a mistake? That, my friends, is the end of, pay, of chapter 9. We are now on chapter 10. And we'll pick this up tomorrow. What can citizens do about nuclear electricity? Well, let's hope it will give us some good sound ideas that have been summarily shuffled away and forgotten, right? I mean, there, there is something that we can do. Um, I believe that that's our mission together. Here we are on the YouTubes hanging by a thread and clinging together because we know that we need to save the planet and I think it's imperative and up to us. So put your courage feet on you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.